What is sound? Let's start by having a definition that's simple but wrong and slowly make it more complex. Sound is air. In space, no one can hear you scream. Why? Because there's no air. No air, no sound. But wait, then why can't we hear air all the time? No, let's say sound is air pressure. Sound isn't literally air, but rather it pushing on your ear. Air is made up of a bunch of molecules just floating around, bouncing off each other, and some of them randomly hit your eardrum, putting force on it. The combination of all the molecules hitting your eardrum puts pressure on it, and that's what generates sound. Except, since usually air is all around you and constantly hitting your ears, how can there be silence? That's because sound is change in air pressure. Okay, you in the pool. You've gotten used to the water, so at this point, you don't feel it anymore. Suddenly, Josh goes and does a cannonball and a wave comes towards you, which you feel and it pushes you. Sound is like that wave. It's not the water that you feel, but the change in the water levels that pushes you. There's a key difference with sound comparatively. The water wave moves slowly, but to actually hear sound, it has to be fast because sound is sudden change in air pressure. The slowest air pressure can change and you'd even be able to hear it is 1 40th of a second. But actually, even then at best you might hear a pop because a sudden drop or raise in air pressure doesn't last very long. In order to really hear anything for say a second or any amount of time, the air pressure has got to be constantly going up and down, back and forth all the time because sound is sudden changes in air pressure over a period of time. Okay, we're stopping here. This is our definition, even though we could definitely be more pedantic. But how do we generate constant changes in air pressure fast enough to even hear? Well, basically, everything vibrates. So, for example, think about a guitar string. If you pluck it, it'll move back and forth extremely rapidly. When it moves forward, it pushes the air forward. And then when it moves backward, it slows the air down. Thus, all the air molecules look a lot like stripes coming into your ear. A whole bunch push on your eardrum, pushing it back, then only a few come in, pushing a lot less, and so your eardrum moves forward again, but then more come in. Basically meaning your eardrum will vibrate at the same rate a guitar string does, 200 times per second or so, depending on the string, then the back and forth motion of your eardrum is then sent off to your brain to be processed as sound. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a guitar string. You hit your desk and that wood moves back and forth too, just it goes back to its initial state a lot quicker so the sound doesn't last as long and also it vibrates a lot more randomly so it sounds more like noise than a music note. Final records have the sound waves etched directly into them and you might notice that you can still hear them quietly even with the speaker off. The needle follows the troughs and that needle then pushes the air in the exact way that the music was recorded. The air hits your ears and your eardrum vibrates in sync with the needle, but probably delayed slightly because sound waves move at only one-fifth of a mile per second. That's analog sound though. What about electronic sound? Well, here I'm generating a waveform, which is usually how sound is represented. You can think of it like this blue line represents the air pressure, where it's higher when it's above the line and lower when below. But I like to imagine that a speaker actually has a piston inside of it going up and down, and the line represents the height of the piston within the speaker. Speakers don't actually work this way, but it's a decent mental model for me. But if we go and zoom in really far in the waveform, you'll see that in digital sound, the waveform turns into a series of points. And each of these points is an instruction that tells us the height that the piston should be at. And there are over 40,000 of these instructions each second. That piston pushes the air just like the vinyl record did, and your eardrum vibrates in just the same way as the speaker does. Now what's neat is that we can actually write some code to directly control the theoretical piston inside the speaker. Here's some code. It's a bit annoying with setting up how audio context works and whatnot, but essentially this is what we're doing. So we've got this black box function that's connected to a speaker. Um, we go and we feed it a sequence of values, and then it goes and moves the piston in the exact way that we specified. So in this case, one is the piston fully up, and negative one is the piston fully down. Now I could go and explain how all this code works right now, but I'm going to do that in the next video. So instead I have a link to this code in the description under sound function. So we're just going to take this code, we're going to open up Notepad or Notepad++, paste it in there. Hold on, we have to add script tags to the top and bottom here. Save it somewhere. 
as uh, something.html, and then you can go and open it up, which it does nothing yet. So go back to the code here. And the reason this does nothing is because our sound array, which is our array of values that we're sending into the speaker, is currently empty. So we just have to put some values in there. And um, pretty much the easiest thing we could do would be random noise, because if we put in, say, all zeros, that would be silence. All ones would be the same thing, because sound requires change. So how do we make our speaker play random noise? Well, we're going to do that with an array uh, and a for loop. The array is just the list of all the values, and it's got to be a long list, because remember, we're sending in over 40,000 of them per second. Or in this case, it's exactly defined as 48,000 per second. These individual values are usually called samples. So if we have 48,000 samples per second, that's the sample rate. So let's say we want to generate three seconds of random noise. We're going to need 48,000 times three samples for that, or 144,000. So let's make a for loop here, run it from zero to 144,000, or more programmatically, sample rate times second, then we just need to give each value in the array a random value. So since our random values need to range from negative 1 to positive 1, math.random only generates between 0 and 1. So we multiply by 2. Now we're generating between 0 and 2, and then subtract 1. So now that our sound array is populated and we're sending in to the function, just save your file and refresh the page. Click the screen. Uh, so that's neat. We're directly controlling the speaker through our own code. But what if we want to make something more musical? Well, we'll have to learn a few terms first. So I've already talked about how a guitar string vibrates back and forth about 200 times per second. In fact, the G string is usually tuned to 196. We call the number of times a string moves back and forth the frequency, which is measured in hertz or cycles per second. Human hearing ranges from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, depending on whether you're old or not. One complete back and forth movement of the string is called the wavelength, or actually, since we're dealing in time and not space, it's called a period. So if you have the free program Audacity, you can easily generate a 196 hertz tone that goes for one second. And so within this interval of one second, there's actually 196 peaks and 196 valleys. And so from here to here is one period. So there's 196 of those. And so naturally, the reciprocal of that is how long that this lasts for. So there's 1, 196 seconds per cycle, as opposed to Hertz's cycles per second. The height between the peaks and valleys is called the amplitude, which represents how loud the sound is in decibels. Or more frequently, you'll see it measured from 0 to 100 on your volume bar. Okay, we got frequency and amplitude. Those two terms are pretty much all you need to know to make a basic tone anyway. So we're basically going to make this 196 hertz tone within our own code. Though actually, this is too smooth, because um, this is a sine wave. Uh, instead, what we're going to be doing is making a square wave, because it's simpler in that it just goes up and down between 1 and negative 1. The way that we're going to do this is with the modulo function, which is just the remainder in division. So what's our period? We know there's 48,000 samples in a second, so we go and divide that by our frequency, which is 196, and you'll see that it means there's something like 245 samples in one period. So what we're going to do is we're going to just mod our iterator by 245, and we'll say that um, if it's greater than half of that, we set the amplitude to 1, otherwise we set the amplitude to negative 1 which splits our wave into two parts, the back and forth. And so if we save and refresh the page and then click, we hear a tone. So cool, that's one note. Now how do we get all the other notes so we can make music? I guess, I don't know, let's learn some music theory. So that first note is called a reference pitch, and it's actually pretty arbitrary. So before we were using 196 as our pitch, but usually, What's used is 440 hertz for the middle A. Now the way that modern Western music works is that all the notes repeat every 12 keys, seven white, five black, and each set of 12 is called an octave. Now the neat thing is, is that if we want to find the tone that's one octave below 440 hertz, which is also an A, uh, all we do is we divide by two and we figure it's 220 hertz. And you can also do this in the other direction. You just multiply 440 hertz by two and you get 880 hertz, which is one octave above. 
So if you go and line up the 880 hertz and the 440 hertz on top of one another, you'll see that it's a two to one ratio, or there are two waves of the higher octave A in the lower one. Now the next simplest ratio after that is the three to two ratio. So three waves for every two, and that gives us a perfect interval, the perfect fifth. And uh, I could go on and on and on about this theoretical basis of music in a system called just intonation. And it's what some old dudes used to tune their instruments to, to play concerto in B flat major or whatever. And you might notice that they always put the key in all these old compositions, and it's because back in the day everyone had to be in tune with each other, and tuning instruments didn't have an actual standard, so some cities would have A at like 432 hertz, and other at 420. Plus, they couldn't switch keys mid-song because it would sound bad, and that's because the theoretical perfect version of music, called just intonation, is basically broken. Basically, the reason is because if you just keep doing these 3 to 2 ratios, you eventually end right back up at the note you started at, except it's slightly off. It's off by about a quarter of a note, and that's called the Pythagorean comma. And the big problem is, is that you can't play Wonderwall if you can't switch keys every two seconds. So we invented another system of music called Equal Temperament. And in Equal Temperament, all the notes are slightly off from where the ratios say they should be, but only a little bit. And the main advantage is that you can go from E minor to G to D and it won't sound terrible. Uh, and since that's the standard for all of modern Western music, that's how we're going to calculate our notes with equal temperament. Um, and so basically the way that we're gonna do that, right? Um, we're just gonna, there's, there's 12 notes, right? Uh, and we can just scatter them equidistantly between 440 and 880, right? Because octaves are the only thing that remains the same. Right, okay, no, actually, right, it doesn't look like that because those are all evenly spaced. It looks more like this, where on the left side they're closer together, on the right side they're farther apart because the notes are exponential. So think about how we get the next octave. We do 440 times 2 raised to the octave we're trying to get to. So, for example, if we're trying to go one octave higher, we raise 2 to the 1, and so that's basically just doing 440 by 2, and we get 880. If we're trying to go two octaves lower, then it's kind of like multiplying 440 by a quarter, so dividing by 4, and we get 110. But if we want to get notes instead of octaves, we got to do this annoying math where we raise 2 to the 1 12th, or take the 12th root of 2, Right, our derived note is 440 times the 12th root of 2 raised to the note that we're trying to get to. For example, we want to go three notes up, do 440 times the 12th root of 2 raised to the 3, and we get 523.25. So using this formula is all we need to calculate all the other notes in equal temperament. Right, and so after just a little bit of tinkering, we have this. Uh, which doesn't sound perfect because we don't have attack, decay, stain, release, but we'll do that next time. Okay, I've run out of script now.